to our precision medicine uh, seminar today. Um, it's my sincere pleasure uh, to introduce a friend and a really smart guy, uh, you know, even some days, uh, Mike Talkowski. Um, Mike is the chief or director of the uh, Center for Genomic Medicine um, at the Broad. He's an associate professor at Harvard and Mass General Hospital. And as you know, the Broad is a combination of Harvard and M MIT. So he's all over the place. Um, Mike's um, interests and skills are um, really um, genomic uh, analysis, building genomic platforms. Uh, basically, his interest in particular is neurodevelopmental genomic uh, problems, as well as fetal structural abnormalities and stillbirths. Um, Mike's most recent work, which many of you may have seen, was in the New England Journal about two months ago, maybe less, in when he demonstrated the ability uh, to do uh, fetal exome sequencing by drawing blood from the mom, which is a gigantic uh, improvement and possibility, and I'm sure he will touch on that. So thank you for coming. One last comment. Um, the speaker in this room doesn't work. So anybody that has any questions or comments, we'd ask you to type them uh, in. And we've got somebody that's going to watch them. Do you prefer to finish and then they'll ask their questions? No, send them as I go. Okay, great. Thank Very you. happy to chat back and forth. Yep. I believe I am. It's not being shared on Zoom. It's connected. Got it? Yep. I will get there. Okay. So everybody can hear me. Um, now I can see the Zoom. All right, great. Thank you, Ron. Um, I have uh, long been working with Ron and have been fascinated over the years at all the things that he finds interesting um, and has delved into. He has uh, really, I think, covered the spectrum of genomic medicine in many ways. And over the years, uh, we have worked together on um, fetal genomics as well as just human genetics and genomic medicine. So I thought I would take this time to sort of give a um, overview of where we are in terms of our work in trying to understand the what I refer to often as the cycle of genomic medicine, which is the concept that genomic medicine um, will only be successful in the field in precision medicine if we begin with understanding individuals and understanding populations and then traverse to understanding genetic variation and its association with phenotype, moving the field to a place where we really begin to understand the prosecution of variants and their functional mechanisms, and then and only then really do we have implementation. So I thought it would take a, a spin around that genomic medicine cycle with you um, and describe a few different things. Uh, first of all, disclosures. Um, at various times, we have had reagents, funding, and resources from um, uh, most of the sequencing technology companies, which I think makes me unbiased and being completely biased. Um, and uh, we've worked with Lebo Therapeutics and Ionis uh, on things unrelated to this. We do have a program with Microsoft um, to introduce large language models and, and AI into variant interpretation. So there is some relevance there. So just so you're aware. Um, okay. I haven't talked about this work in 10 years easily, but uh, the NIFS, the non-invasive sequencing kept coming up um, at dinner and, and a few other discussions. So I thought it would start here, uh, which was about 10 years ago um, or more we had developed some methods to um, sequence chromosomal rearrangements uh, through a method called jumping libraries. And in, in this one example, which was really, uh, it was a single example of a case of an amniocentesis where a karyotype found a balanced rearrangement, a prediction was made of a likely phenotype as we've shown over the last 10 years. When we sequence balanced rearrangements and get to the exact nucleotide that's disrupted, the karyotype, of course, is always off by at least the subband, and it's 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 virtually impossible to predict um, any gene disrupted. Here, we were able to get to 
an individual gene and, and predict a diagnosis of charge syndrome in a, in a fetal sample that ended up um, ended up being a demise uh, in, in the final trimester. Um, but the, the example was there of how one could arrive at getting DNA, sequence a genome, and get to an individual nucleotide that may influence phenotype. This was published back to back with the Wapner et al. study um, that effectively validated microarrays for a copy number variance in prenatal diagnosis. And as I'll come back to over and over again, I felt at the time it, it was a bit of a paradigm shift for prenatal genetics going to microarrays and copy number variants as a first tier screen, but also where we were beginning to understand that in introducing microarrays, we were losing these exact balance rearrangements that were detected. And it turned out that you know the, the, the path became doing both. Um, and then eventually we'll go to exome sequencing. And when we move to exome sequencing, we give up in information uh, from the previous test. And so I'll, I'll show you how I think we can get to a place where we capture all of this. At the same time, in parallel, there was this just amazing work done, not in parallel, this was done much earlier, um, where it became very clear uh, that not only could you find um, fetal DNA from cell-free um, uh, cell-free DNA circulating in maternal blood and, and, and from the maternal plasma, um, which had been known for a long time. But in fact, you could quantify that and in work from a number of different labs, including Dennis Lowe and others, um, showed that you could capture individual chromosome aneuploidy, sex chromosomes, and very, very large abnormalities. Um, and over the years, I'll show you where we have derived new information to try to bring this to, uh, as Ron said, um, an approach that really is is higher resolution and of value to um, all pregnant persons. So here's the idea. Uh, as I just described that genomic medicine cycle and the um, concept of capturing population variation on very large scale and then bringing that to bear in precision medicine, uh, within our centers, I was describing to the trainees today, um, it... it, it for a hospital system that is not terribly prescient in terms of pushing things forward quickly, um, about 20 years ago, they actually were in the concept that genetics would pervade most aspects of medicine. And so the idea of having the genetics and genomics experts tucked into their each individual department was probably losing some of the power of the collaborative ecosystem that could exist. Um, and so we formed this center, uh, which is a cross-departmental thematic center that cuts across departments. And so all the geneticists are living together in that space. And this is the exact reason is, in theory, genomic information can impact all of healthcare um, and, and, and many, many different phenotypes. And this is just a look at, at, at some ways in which, you know, genetics really brings utility um, from the earliest um, points of development and into... Um, of course, adulthood and 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 um, certainly even in uh, later uh, geriatric uh, conditions. What I'm going to focus on today, and and really the focus of most of our research, is this early prenatal prenatal period through developmental disorders, and then to some extent into a little bit later onset neuropsychiatric disorders. And this is where genetics has been incredibly successful. Um, I would say the tip of the spear has always been neurodevelopmental disorders and intellectual disability just because of the profound um, impact that variants have in these diseases. But as we move on, uh, there has been a lot of amazing work across many, many different phenotypes in finding variants that live in this space. So I think it's always important to um, think about this, and we were just talking about this with the trainees, so I put the slide in, of fertility ratios. And what type of genetic variation strongly impacts fecundity? Because these are the variants that will appear within a given sample, usually arising de novo, have an extremely deleterious impact on fecundity and will not then proliferate within the population and move to high allele frequency. So they are always held at very low allele frequencies in the population. This underlies everything that I'm gonna tell you about um, and, and really almost everything that we have in terms of rare variant interpretation um, because there are traits in which these rare variants can act very strongly um, uh, on fecundity and thus are selected against in the population. At the very top of that list, of course, is autism, intellectual disability, and neurodevelopmental disorders. Okay, so knowing that, the driving goal of everything we're doing is, uh, are these coming up? Are these right here? Um, to understand complete genetic architecture. And in doing so, I think I, I would like to just um, level set everybody 
on some of the discussions at, at, at dinner last night, which is exactly why this is such a fundamental challenge. Um, and so, you know, as Yufeng understands well, if we look on the um, y-axis here, it is the, uh, the, the de novo rates of variation or how often they're observed in a given population by class. And then on the x-axis is relative risk in autism. And I'm using autism as an example, but put your highly selected against phenotype of interest here. And en masse, without annotation or understanding what gene it underlies, if you think about what we've known for decades, it's the very large CNVs are deleterious. But let's be clear, you're only talking about a relative risk of a little bit above three if you harbor a very large de novo CNV. And we've done a lot of work in Nomad to show about 2% of the population has megabase sized CNVs, um, even when you, you go to sequence resolution. If we have a de novo loss of function or protein truncating variant, then we have an odds ratio of about 1.8. It's not until we understand where these variants are, what they do, and what genes are intolerant to these variants, that we can then push these odds ratios up to a place that you think about in precision medicine, which is odds ratios of 20, 30, up to 100. <clears throat> It's actually really surprising if you think about a de novo missense variant, how weak an effect that has if you don't know how to annotate that de novo missense variant, even when you have the coding region in the, in the triplet code cipher in which to understand the functional impact of that missense variant. So then if you think about a de novo non-coding variant, which is all the way up here, extraordinarily weak effect and about a hundred new ones per generation. Uh, so where we really end up is in this way that if we can't interpret variation and annotate that variation to push those variants into a higher level of the relative risk ratio by clever approaches to annotation, which are only really brought about by understanding population variation, then we're pretty much buried into only the most extreme variants in the genome. Okay, so what do we have to do to get there? What do we, where do we need to um, derive resources and goals towards that exact um, approach? So. I'm gonna talk about a few primary barriers, barriers to architecture studies. The first is complete ascertainment of genomic variation. Uh, I think that you have all seen that in, in the last two or three years, uh, there have been a number of programs. Um, I'm part of the Human Genome Structural Variation Consortium, as well as the HPRC with its uh, telomere to telomere assemblies, where this is really moving forward quite nicely. I'm not gonna talk about long read sequencing much today because it's its own talk, uh, but we've been doing a lot of work with long read sequencing and we're getting near complete ascertainment of an individual genome. Of course, that doesn't help us very much when it comes to interpreting uh, a patient that walks in the door against the reference source. We need robust references and structural variation uh, is certainly among them. It's a class of variation that has not been explored in depth in population um, programs, although we're getting much further along there with scalable tools. And then we need metrics for interpretation, prosecution of those variants into a, a variant of function or V2F biology. I think this remains the grand challenge in our field. Uh, I'm not going to touch on this, but there are major um, um, NHGRI and other consortia pushing this forward. And then pushing the boundaries of, tough, uh, of technologies, I think, with sober benchmarking of the value added by each technology. Okay, so I'm going to move through some of these slides very quickly, um, just to, to give you some sense of each of those pieces. And I'm going to start with NOMAD, the Genome Aggregation Database. <clears throat> this is work we've been doing for quite a long time, begun by uh, Daniel MacArthur and Mark Daly with um, the Exome Aggregation Consortium. The idea for NOMAD is to create an open reference resource for the biomedical community to adopt and use free of any use restrictions and free of, of really any barriers whatsoever. We release the data on a website. It's aggregated count data. You can't get to the individual or the individual variant, so there's no PHI released. Um, and in this way, for any gene in the genome and any site, we can tell you the exact allele frequency that we observe. This has really become a ubiquitous resource for clinical interpretation. Uh, almost all um, diagnostic pipelines begin with an allele frequency uh, um, uh, filtering strategy, uh, but also human knockout studies and powering disease association studies and understanding some of the, the insights into human demography. I will say that um, as a community and as a lab, uh, running Nomad is, is pretty awful. Uh, it is a lot of work. It is an enormous amount of QC. Um, the trainees work forever and ever and ever. And by the minute they, you know, the, the minute they get to that VCF and they're ready to do their science, we just give it away to everybody for free. Uh, so we actually don't do any analysis at all in Nomad until everybody has access to the data, um, which is sort of the ethos. And, and everybody's bought in uh, very much a, a testament to the leadership of Daniel and Mark and Heidi Rehm and, and, and others. 
Um, but that's where we are uh, with Nomad. And our latest release was 730,000 exomes. Um, one of the exciting parts of this is it was about 25% uh, non-European genetic ancestry. So still predominantly European. And we had a big blue wave of, of, um, of Caucasian ancestry from the UK Biobank. But still, we continue to collect from as many resources as we can and try to aggregate, harmonize, and then release these data. Why is this important? Other than having population allele frequency estimates, it's this. So, I mean, I think if I leave you with nothing, and this is a, a, an already um, fairly well-established concept, uh, but it will be this, and this is why such variation is so important, is as we add more and more variants, we can begin to get estimates of exactly how many variants we expect to see in every gene in the genome. And then as we move further and further towards saturation, we can get an estimate for every variant that we expect in every nucleotide in the genome. And right now in NOMAD, we're, we're moving towards the point that we see a variant in, I, I think the number is something like two out of every three on average um, uh, uh, nucleotides and in, 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 in the um, uh, two out of every three bases uh, within the coding sequence. So we're getting there towards a, a concept of saturation. Now, of course, we, we don't see every nucleotide in everyone, so there's a lot of work yet to do. But in doing that, we can say, okay, what is my expected observation of a variant within this region? And if I and then if I can annotate that variant, we can say, what do I expect to see in terms of loss of function variants? I can then count how often I observe those variants, and I end up with a, a loss of function upper bound fraction, which is a, um, a fancy way of putting together that observed over expected ratio with a little bit of um, uh, quantitative setting of what the upper bound fraction on that, and, and we call this LUF. As you can see, LUF is a continuous trait, a continuous metric. And if you take it from zero to 100, the smallest values are those in which variants are least likely to be observed in terms of loss of function variants in the population. And as you move up to 100%, those are genes in which variants are often observed in the population. Almost all of the haploinsufficient genes that are known in disease live in the bottom three deciles of LUF, which means that we are already very, very good at prioritizing which genes are intolerant to mutation. This gets a little worse when we talk about missense variation, and there's a lot of projects ongoing for missense variation, but at least for haploinsufficiency and loss of function variation, we can quantify this. Okay, we then have many, many classes of variants other than point mutations within um, the coding region of the genome. And of course, we have copy number variants and, and insertions and mobile elements and repeat expansions and inversions, and this collective class of structural variants that we've been working on very hard over the years. I'm not gonna talk about methods at all um, because it's boring, but it, it's really, really important. We have spent years uh, putting together pipelines, many, many years um, to, to process, analyze, and annotate structural variants in the genome from short read sequencing, exome sequencing, and now long read sequencing. All of our methods are open source. They live in Terra. Anybody can access them. Anybody can run the Whittles. Um, you know, they, they become very challenging because there is no silver bullet for a given algorithm for structural variants to this day. And this is true for long read or short read sequencing. So we actually use an ensemble of five algorithms. Each one brings a little bit of unique perspective and, and, and a different class of variants um, into the um, into the data set. Uh, and so this is uh, effectively where we are right now um, for short read sequencing. But in the new NOMAD data set, um, there are 69 million uh, uh, short variants or SMVs and indels and 1.2 million structural variants per genome. And we're averaging around 11 and a half thousand structural variants in every short read genome. This is compared to about 25,000 structural variants in every long read genome. And when you compare what we find in a long read genome versus what we find in a short read genome, somewhere around 80% of the variants missed by short reads live in simple repeats and segmental duplications. So there are variants that live outside of that coding region of the gene genome that we've already showed you, we've quantified fairly well, and in the regions that we have no quantification for, no understanding of selection, and very little in terms of reference resources. So that's the next major challenge is as we move to more structural variant discovery, um, how do we begin to set a background rate of expectation? The reason it's important is because even from short read sequencing, about 25% of all loss of function variants that we, all loss of function rare variants that we see in a given genome come from structural variants. So by failing to quantify structural variants accurate, accurately in a given genome, 
we are basically missing 25% of the high impact variants in the genome. And then just to quickly show that there are many, many different classes of structural variants. These are all in controls. This is just one slide to say, here's 11 mutational subclasses that we've already coded up and we see in every genome. Uh, they are selected against more than any, uh, than the average structural variant, but yet these are routinely observed. They're observed at low frequencies, but they're in all genomes. And, you know, several years ago, we would have seen variants like this, like a chromosome shattering or chromothripsis, as we call it, and certainly have thought this was a deleterious variant. Um, here we have a 56-year-old perfectly healthy adult male that has a 49 breakpoint event all scattered around multiple chromosomes in the genome, all shoved into a small piece of chromosome one. So their chromosome one actually has a segment that includes breakpoints of 49, di 49 different small segments from throughout the genome, um, inverted in, in the same strand and put into, this, put into that one section. And yet this human being is perfectly healthy. And we had a thousand explanations for this um, because we found this in the first version of Nomad, but in the new version of Nomad, we find that this is actually a polymorphic variant. So we have three observations now in Nomad of this exact same chromothripsis variant, all in healthy individuals and all identical breakpoints and identical rearrangements. So these types of variants are lurking in all genomes and we really, really need ways in which we can annotate them and understand which are deleterious and which are not. Um, you know, the big secret is uh, unsurprisingly um, in all, almost all the analyses we've done so far, it just matters, addresses everything. So if you happen to have horrible variation that never touches a constrained gene or an OMIM gene or a gene that's highly selected against, we seem to tolerate these things pretty well if we don't have a lot of uh, a large loss of material. And even if we do in gene deserts, they seem to be tolerated very well. Um, so we have a lot of data looking at relative risk, but uh, variants like this are, are surprising and yet they exist. Okay, so... Um, the next step is interpreting structural variants that alter genes. And the reason we need to do this is because structural variants, there is a prediction of deletions and their correlation with loss of function variation, right? So I showed you these left deciles before. And if we think about those deciles of loss of function variation against a protein truncating vari uh, variant, a loss of function intolerance to protein truncating variant, it's no surprise that this is highly correlated with deletion. What's somewhat surprising is it's also highly correlated with duplication. Um, in fact, the, the correlation of loss of function variation with duplication variation is about 0.8. And it turns out that the correlation is still pretty strong, even if we look at partial duplication of exons within a gene. So if anybody's thought about diagnostics, how often do you look at duplication of two exons within a gene and think about how to interpret that if it's a gene of interest or one exon? And we've begun to quantify this, and it looks like for a lot of these genes that are intolerant to loss of function variation, as well as deletion, even small duplications that touch on the coding sequence and may move the coding sequence out of frame are equally selected against. And what we basically describe this as is as we begin to predict constraint, constraint marks a general intolerance to all structural variants. And so we consider this dosage sensitivity. And dosage sensitivity is really an intolerance to a change in copy number. And there's two types that, that I think are worth considering. There's haploinsufficiency or loss of DNA um, at a given site, loss of one copy. And then there's triplosensitivity or gain of DNA and the deleterious effect from triplosensitivity. In the field for a very long time, we have certainly mapped haploinsufficiency um, to a very significant degree. What we have had very little insight into is triplosensitivity. In fact, the ACMG criteria, I believe, had 17 genes uh, that were marked as triplosensitive uh, a few years ago. And so we really wanted to begin to understand what dosage sensitivity looked like across the genome in coding and non-coding segments. And to do that, I'm not going to talk about the details at all of this study. I'm just going to show you where it ended up. Uh, we aggregated together about a million samples from chromosomal microarrays, uh, from diagnostic labs and research programs um, across 54 different phenotypes. And from these samples, we ended up with a, you know, a, a very large number of structural variants. We had deletions and duplications. And we did both mapping of large genomic segments as well as individual genes to predict dosage sensitivity. And again, this is a, an entire study. It's published um, and you can look at it, but I just bring it up because I wanna 
close out the kind of armamentarium of variants that we can consider in, in the future of genomic medicine with these CNVs and show that through a series of machine learning methods and, and, and approaches where we could quantify the expectation of structural variants and copy number variants, we end up expanding to about 1,500 triplosensitive genes in the human genome. And these are genes in which, while deletions are stronger on average than duplications, the duplications themselves in these genes are comparable to the effect of a loss of function constrained gene. And almost 400 of these triplosensitive genes are not loss of function constrained, which means there's a, a pocket of variation in triplosensitivity that we were not accessing previously and very likely actually are moving us towards a different mechanism than loss of function itself. And if I take variants from neurodevelopmental disorders, and I'll talk about this next, but I, I just wanna give you a sense of why this may be really important, that look triplosensitive, what we see, and here's a large collection of exome sequencing from neurodevelopmental disorders, um, is effectively, we have an enrichment of protein truncating coding variants and deletions, completely unsurprising. We also have a, a slight enrichment of missense variants and duplication. When we correct for known genes in the genome in neurodevelopmental disorders, the, the effect in deletion almost goes away. However, it gets even stronger when we correct for known genes of missense variants in triplosensitive genes. So if we remove everything we know about neurodevelopmental disorder association and say, what genes are triplosensitive and where do we see significant enrichment of missense variants that we have not implicated in phenotype before, we actually see these to be highly enriched, which suggests additional mechanisms that we really have not um, captured in a meaningful way in those studies. And so I'll close out with the reference um, discussions by just saying that uh, those resources are available. Nomad, all of us is coming um, there. Uh, this is an old slide, uh, but there at the time were um, 413,000 survey responses. Um, there's now 245,000 genomes that have been released. We've called structural variants on 100,000 of them. They'll be coming out very soon. We've also called 1,000 African-American samples uh, with PAC bio sequencing. Um, so the data have been aligned. We've called variants and they're all released as well. This is all on researcher workbench. Um, and, and it just keeps growing and growing and growing. We intend to have 15,000 to 20,000 long read um, samples in the next several years. We're processing these data. And once again, they're openly and freely released. Okay. What's the point of all this? Uh, I'm going to show you where we have gone with autism and neurodevelopmental disorders in beginning to aggregate data and then try to end with where we can use this information to interpret in prenatal diagnostics. I may run out of time, so I'm gonna go through this a little bit quickly. Um, here are the cohorts that we have. Everything that I'm gonna talk about is, is based on these cohorts first. Uh, so you see we have in the TRIO framework, um, at this point in this study, um, 15,000 uh, TRIOs, and among those is 5,000 quartets. So we have um, a proband, an unaffected sibling for 5,000 samples, as well as parents. And then the, the prior case control studies in autism from these various collections, um, we had about 8,000 or 5,000 uh, additional cases. We have a lot more now with a, a recent release of Spark, um, but it's really those proband families that we're most interested in right now to begin to quantify de novo variation. And then there's the study deciphering developmental disorders, which are ascertained for developmental delay um, in this wonderful paper from the DDD cohort uh, in Caplanis et al. Um, that was 31,000 trios. So what we have is a cohort ascertained for being diagnosed with autism and a cohort ascertained for being diagnosed with developmental delay. Now, of course, we all know there's a lot of heterogeneity there. The cohort ascertained for developmental delay has about a 25% diagnostic rate of autism uh, within the sample, uh, 20 to 25% based on the criteria they have. Um, and the question is, can we begin to understand the genetic architecture of these studies? The Simons Foundation uh, funded a number of different projects. This is the one that, that um, we pushed forward in Fu et al. Uh, with the uh, Autism Sequencing Consortium. Yu Feng and Wendy, uh, Wendy Chung uh, had a, a parallel um, analyses that, that were very, very similar and had very similar results. Uh, and I think really quite unique results, uh, including analyses of inherited variation. But here's how, how we basically see these studies moving forward. And again, I do think these concepts are applicable to any disease that you're looking at. 
Functional annotation and gene level measures of selection can now allow us to weight genes and variants in rare variant studies. So everything that I've just told you about gives you a prior as to the likelihood of association. If we can integrate that information as well as copy number variants from exome sequencing, which we've never really had at meaningful scale. I mean, if you think about it, have you really looked at any exome-based single exon deletion cohorts in doing an association study or even in, in diagnostics at times it's used, uh, but more often it's not. So this was really our first very large scale evaluation of exon resolution CNVs that we can now incorporate into our framework and then build an analytic framework. This was done by Bernie Devlin and Catherine Rader um, called TADA uh, to incorporate these estimates of strength of association. This is the framework. I think for time, I'll skip it all. Uh, other than to say it's an adaptable Bayesian framework that allows us to say, what's the class of variation, a protein truncating variant, a missense variant, or a copy number variant? Can we then weight the protein truncating variants based on constraint? Can we weight the missense variants based on constraints? And can we weight the copy number variants based on dosage sensitivity? And then we can introduce family-based studies as well as case control studies every time we do an analysis. We get a base factor that tells us the strength of association or the strength of evidence against association. And collectively, that then brings us to a base factor for every gene in the genome, which we can then convert to an FDR and understand exactly what the strength of association is for every gene in the genome. If we do that in autism, this is what we find. So we very, very conservatively um, converted that FDR into somewhat of an equivalent of a Bonferroni correction for all genes in the genome, did a series of permutation tests, uh, or did a series of comparisons against permutation tests and said, at this FDR, this is about genome-wide significant. We find 72 genes for autism. The number of genes doesn't matter. It's about to triple in, in, in a few months. Um, but what is interesting is if you look at the types of genes and then the color of each of these genes, because this is starting to give you insight into the allelic architecture of gene discovery in autism and developmental disorders and the contribution of any given class of variation to specific genes. Some genes being driven by protein truncating variants, other genes being driven by missense variants, um, some by deletion and a few by duplication and missense variants together. Overall, though, the dominant factor is de novo protein truncating variants, which contributes about 70% of all association evidence within the cohort. As we move on and begin to ask questions about the combination of autism in those developmental disorder studies, we can say, okay, well, if we take our statistics and work done by the DDD cohort using a, a different approach, which was more of a frequentist approach, we find that the correlation of statistics is extraordinarily high. We can then combine these two studies together. And when we look for the number of risk genes that we get, we can see what overlaps between the two and derive a, a final result. Um, and this is what this is. So by combining autism and developmental disorders, I wanna make this point because I think as we think about different phenotypes, and, and at the end, we'll talk about birth defects and structural birth defects and fetal anomalies. What we really see is that intellectual disability and developmental delay continues to be the strongest effects of anything that we look at in the genome, including multiple congenital anomalies and, and truly any other phenotype at this point um, in the studies that we have done in developmental disorders, where in that kind of most constrained decile, we see the largest burden of de novo protein truncating variants. And that's true um, for missense variants as well at a lower effect size, but still true. In comparison of developmental delay to autism, you can see the strength of association there. When we put these together, we arrive at about 375 genes associated with global neurodevelopmental um, risk. Uh, and like I said, the, the gene number doesn't matter really because they're going to continue to increase. It's, it's the mode of analyses that we do. When we put them together, we find 54 genes that were not associated either phenotype alone, showing the strength of the association power. But what becomes more interesting is the um, ability to go out even further and say 665 genes at an FDR of 0.05. And what are the pathways that they belong to? What are the analyses that we can do from these large sets of genes? And if we begin to ask questions about copy number variants and those small copy number variants, um, you can see how profound it is to have these gene lists. When we look at de novo copy number variants in cases, the ratio is 134 to one of cases versus controls. So you see extraordinary effects in these genes where basically uh, 
controls almost never have these variants. Now the question of how do we disentangle phenotypes? And I think um, I've been asked about this so many times. And, and it's an interesting, interesting question. So here we have developmental delay in autism, different mutational burdens. But what if we downsample those mutational burdens and then begin to ask, are there certain genes that just seem to be more susceptible to one phenotype and mutation in one phenotype versus another? So we start here with developmental delay in autism, which are very, very closely related. You can imagine introducing ADHD and schizophrenia and, and you know, congenital heart defects and, and, and varied um, neuropsychiatric disorders or developmental disorders into this framework. But this is where we are. And when we downsample and we ask among the genes that we know, what is the likelihood of observing a variant um, in a, a gene associated with autism to be also associated with developmental delay? And it turns out that almost all of the genes associated with autism, about 85% from these analyses, also have a comparable um, or higher uh, rate of observation in developmental delay, but about 15% actually don't. And we can quantify this further by looking at the distributions. And, and just a long story short is we have this set of genes in autism that are not autism genes or autism specific genes. I mean, I wanna be very clear about that right now. But they are genes that have different mutational properties if you have a diagnosis of autism than if you have a diagnosis of developmental delay. And in this way, you can see, I showed you that waterfall of genes. Well, those genes live in different places on that waterfall. They seem to have different strengths of evidence. And there's a number of different ways that we can begin to quantify this. We're nowhere near getting there. But the idea that genetic architecture is actually somewhat distinct among these phenotypes looks valid. And you know, as we move forward, we have been aggregating data from diagnostic labs and other sources. And it looks like among exome sequencing, when somebody comes in with a diagnosis of autism, their genetic architecture does look different than global developmental delay. Um, and that seems to be fairly consistent uh, across these cohorts. So a lot of work to do there, um, but this is where we stand as a field. We're at about 400 or so um, risk genes for, for global developmental delay. Um, these genes cluster into pathways and cell types that uh, have been well-established over the last several years, um, including transcriptional regulation and neuronal communication and epigenetic mechanisms. Um, I think as power expands, we will expand into new dimensions of autism that have yet to be explored. And I think we will expand into new um, pathways that, that will allow us uh, new opportunities to understand where, when, and how these genes actually impact development. Over time, the reason that this is so important is because we can aggregate a lot more data. And, and with some of you here uh, and many others in the field, we've been trying to aggregate across developmental disorders both from exome sequencing as well as genome sequencing. Uh, our goal is to try to call structural variants um, on basically every cohort that comes through one of these um, consortia studies, distribute those variants back to the individual sites, let them do analyses on their individual phenotypes, and then do meta-analyses across phenotypes. And again, try to begin to disentangle genetic architectures, not only within neurodevelopmental disorders, but within structural birth defects and across Mendelian disorders. Um, and this work is, is being led by Alba Sanchez Juan and Harrison Brand and a number of individuals in the lab uh, and across our, our consortia. Okay. That's the end of sort of the reference resource and neurodevelopmental disorder section. Um, I think that I, I went through a lot there, uh, but hopefully um, it was uh, fairly straightforward in terms of where we're going as a field and, and the power of the methods that we have now that I think we haven't had uh, in the past. And so then the question is the next step, um, really the unbiased assessment of technologies on diagnostic yields and how we can apply some of those methods to, to diagnoses and new technologies in precision medicine. So for the last 20 minutes or so, that's what I'm going to spend time talking about. Um, we have done these studies in partnership with Ron uh, over many years. Ron was actually a, a co-I on my very first R01 as a new investigator. Um, and it was right after those studies had uh, come out. Um, he was uh, extremely gracious early on. And so it was um, uh, the, the, the first studies that we actually did in fetal anomalies um, and the first analyses uh, were done here at Columbia with Ron, and, and we have continued to work together um, all these years. This study is, uh, again, um, a study where we looked at those quartets 
as well as a cohort of uh, fetal structural anomalies um, derived from here uh, and from Ron and his team, uh, as well as from Katie Gray, uh, who is here and um, was, was our key partner uh, at Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, with Louise Wilkins-Hogue. And we began to ask questions about the genetics of fetal structural anomalies. And what do we actually capture with each new technology? So when whole genome sequencing came to um, be fairly routine, and of course, you've all heard the same story from long read sequencing in the last couple of years, it's the line is always, we're going to diagnose more patients, we're going to diagnose more patients, we're going to diagnose more patients. And of course, we're not going to diagnose more patients until we can interpret all of those variants that I showed you that live outside of protein truncating variants and missense variants, because they're the only ones we can actually interpret in any meaningful way. But what we can do is continue to incrementally increase our diagnostic yields. So we're not going to flip it from 30% to 80%, um, as, as has been shown a number of times in smaller cohorts. But I think over time, we are incrementally increasing with every new technology into the variants that we can interpret. And so that's what we tried to do here, where we had a proband and an unaffected sibling. How often do we actually call a pathogenic variant in a proband? How often do we call them a sibling? And if we start to tune the parameters on that, uh, what increased yield can we get? And then can we apply that to fetal anomalies? And so this is the end, and I won't go through the middle at all um, because I want to talk about the um, non-invasive sequencing, uh, except to really, you know, harbor on this for a second and say you can see that the real transformative technology here was the karyotype. Um, you know, that's where we really started to uh, pick off a huge increase in diagnostic yield. That's in orange. Everything since then, we've added a little and we've lost a little. We've added a little and we've lost a little. So with microarray, we added the large copy number variants. We lost the balance rearrangements. With exome sequencing, we now added nucleotide resolution, which was, of course, incredibly powerful. Um, but we lost the copy number variants and the balance rearrangements. And then at the end of the day, in this study, uh, what we showed is through genome sequencing and very careful and systematic um, computational analyses, you could really recapture everything that was in that karyotype, as well as that microarray, as well as that exome. Now, if you called CNVs from the exome, then the combination of those three technologies actually captured almost everything. Um, the added diagnostic yield of a genome over the combination of the three existing technologies was very, very low. In autism, less than 1%. In the fetal anomaly cohorts, we've always looked at never better than about 4%, um, and really never, never better than 4%. Uh, and you know, the reason is when it's done well, that's where most of the pathogenic variation lives. But I think the argument is one test replaces three. Um, and certainly, if we can do this with one test, we should. And I think, in fact, here in Columbia, is um, that example is, is, is uh, being shown um, through First Seek and a number of other uh, prenatal Seek and other projects where, in the prenatal space, you know, genome sequencing is being advanced as a first tier test. Um, and I think the evidence is very clear that that is the right approach to take um, because of this, this capacity where we will diagnose more patients, but we will also capture all the information that we could have in the other samples. Okay, so given that, we formed this Fetal Genomics Consortium several years ago. And the Fetal Genomics Consortium is really a combined effort of um, Ron and I and Katie uh, and a number of other sites um, within the U.S. and internationally to try to begin to understand fetal genomics and the genetic variation that really impacts fetal development. Uh, we have projects trying to build a cloud-based repository we have projects trying to understand structural anomalies and diagnostic yield that I just showed you. Um, and really the, the flagship project is trying to understand um, uh, the genetic underpinnings of stillbirth. And in particular, the variants that we will never see in the population that are so profoundly selected against that they do not actually make it to birth. What I'm gonna talk about today though is actually not part of those efforts. It's um, work that we have been doing in non-invasive fetal screening only because I know it was of interest to this community. Um, and I thought I would just tell you a little bit uh, about some of the motivations. And I think if you think in chronological order uh, about the studies that have come out and about what we have seen over time, there have been efforts um, to do uh, trisomy screening and um, uh, and uh, sorry, trisomy screening and uh, aneuploidy detection and some targeted sequencing of genes from non-invasive uh, sequencing of cell-free DNA. But on the invasive side, we've had invasive prenatal sequencing. There has been newborn screening. I, I think you're all very familiar with this, with the Guardian study from Wendy Chung, 
uh, that's been described many times and 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 the the efforts to show value um, in newborn sequencing. And then, of course, some of the more dramatic examples have been uh, has been work from Rady Children's Hospital and Stephen Kingsmore and others showing that in an emergent situation in the NICU, um, there can be value uh, both in terms of diagnoses as well as in terms of financial uh, burden in rapid genome sequencing, very rapid genome sequencing. Lots of talks on running a nanopore or running a whole genome sequencing and analyzing those data um, you know, very, very rapidly to bring value to the patient. And I think our argument is simply, maybe we have a lot more time than um, those 24 hours that they're trying to sequence that genome because the genome exists you know, from, from fertilization, right? And so in fact, in the first trimester of pregnancy, what has happened is there's been a dramatic shift. I think everybody here knows and the uptake of, of this screen, um, I apologize, it's an old slide uh, of non-invasive prenatal screening. Uh, we use very different um, uh, acronyms now, but uh, in any event, um, there has been a significant uptake of um, uh, NIPS for um, aneuploidy detection over the last several years as this became a routine test. And actually in precision medicine, I mean, this is an amazing success story. There's very few things. Uh, that we have seen, um, not only in genetics, but across precision medicine that has seen this level of uptake. Well, we have this information. Streck tubes are being collected in the first trimester of pregnancy, and a small number of variants are being captured during that. So can we design a non-invasive test early in fetal development to capture the exact variation I just showed you in autism and developmental disorders um, and, and exome sequencing from that same Streck tube uh, that would really allow us to capture the relevant variation in precision medicine and the relevant recordable variation early in pregnancy. And so that's what we've been working on. Again, just a quick look at this. I'm going to run out of time, so I'm going to skip through this very quickly. I think everybody here knows this, um, that there's non-invasive prenatal, scre uh, prenatal screening um, in the first trimester uh, for aneuploidies and in a small number of genes. Uh, there's some targeted panels, um, as well as, of course, one can um, get CVS and amnio. Uh, from 10 to 12 weeks, um, past 14 weeks, uh, and then um, ultrasound uh, is able to pick up anomalies um, in the second trimester, but these are all low resolution screens. Okay, so we did a proof of concept pilot of non-invasive prenatal screening um, in 51 pregnancies. And in these 51 pregnancies, we did a maternal blood draw, we extracted cell-free DNA, we spent a lot of time trying to isolate um, and enrich for fetal fractions as much as we could by size selecting and, and, and developing different methods to um, enrich for the DNA that we wanted and remove the maternal DNA as best we could, uh, as well as then capture sequencing. And we built bioinformatics pipelines uh, to try to get to clinical interpretation and return of results um, where we had non-invasive uh, exome sequencing. This was work that we did with Katie and Brigham and Women's Hospital. She's a co-senior author on the paper. Um, they did all of the sample collection. They were able to, in fact, uh, get us matched um, uh, DNA from um, uh, samples with amniocentesis or cord blood. Um, so this was quite a long study over several years. Uh, but in essence, the, the effort led to um, a sample where we had 51 samples uh, that we tested. We had direct fetal sequencing in 12 of them. Um, we had uh, the cell-free DNA sequencing in all 51. And, um, and then we were able to obtain a maternal exome uh, in, in 28 samples. This is a look at the fetal fraction um, by trimester. And effectively, we started this um, with third trimester pregnancies. And the reason we started with third trimester pregnancies is we wanted to see if it was possible with the maximum amount of cell-free DNA we could possibly get. And so this is very much in the technology development mode of let's hit this with a sledgehammer and see how we can do. Um, and then we started to dial it back to first and second trimester pregnancies, where as expected, you start to lose fetal fraction. Um, although the early work certainly enriched where even in the first trimester, we were getting a little over 10% fetal fraction. Okay, then it comes to these analyses and why this is so hard. Uh, so I'm gonna walk you through each of these peaks and then probably run out of time for everything else, but maybe this is all you really need to understand. So if we sequence, cell-free DNA, what do we have? We have a fetal genome and we have a maternal genome. And the fetal genome is comprised of mother and father. So there are variants that are de novo, 
in the fetus, and there are variants that are paternal um, in the fetus, and those variants don't exist in the mother. There are then variants that exist in the mother and the fetus, and this is the largest peak, right? So this is the heterozygous peak. Now, the problem is if, if an allele is 50-50 because it's heterozygous in the mother, and the fetus is only represented at 10% in that sample, then that allele distribution is actually only, you know, about 50% plus another 10%. So you get a distribution that changes in terms of allele fraction only by the fetal fraction within the sample. So if we look at the de novo variants, they're on the far left here. There are these zero ones. They're variants that didn't exist in the mother. So they sit out there on their own. They're the highest impact variants, as I showed you long ago. Um, and they are actually easily discernible. What gets a little harder is something that is inherited, um, that is in the mother and um, not in the fetus or something that is in the mother and the fetus, but not in the father. And so these distributions start to, to merge together a little bit, but we can build formulas around these and then we can build bioinformatic methods to predict what peak this is in and predict what variant we see and if it's in the fetus or not. So how did it perform? Well, it turns out it, it actually the exomes work pretty well. So uh, in this mode, we ended up with an average coverage of 210x. Um, we were able to look at the uniform coverage and what we really wanted to do was get to about 10 reads uh, per fetal base, but we said we would try eight reads um, and, and try to back calculate from there. And it turned out really uniform. About 96% of bases had 50x coverage or better on the exome, which is what we would hope for in a regular exome. Um, and 96% of the bases had 8x or better in the fetal uh, nucleotides, um, which is, again, I, I think much better than we thought. And the reason was this, which is that in the sample itself, if we look at unfiltered sensitivity, now this is not with the genotyping, but just if we see a variant in the fetus from the truth data, was it in the cell-free DNA? And the answer was almost always yes. Um, so the variants are there to be captured. It's just a matter of if you can develop methods to capture them. And just for time, uh, I'm probably going to run out here. Um, but let's say we, we did a lot of work to go from unfiltered to filtered. And in this final column is where you can see the actual um, accuracy of the method. So early days, a lot of development to be done. I think a lot that can be improved. But if you want to ask the question, if I did an amniocentesis and I captured an exome, and that's my truth, and I did a non-invasive blood test and I captured the exome, you know, somewhere around 90% or better of the time, I can accur accurately predict your genotype. And the really nice part about that um, is this, which I just don't want to miss before I go, is this slide. I think this slide is, is the key one, uh, which is no matter what the fetal fraction was, uh -oh. <laughs> very dramatic, no matter what the fetal fraction was, um, whether we went very low or very high, those de novo variants on the left are always discernible. And so the method actually worked almost perfectly for de novo variants or, or paternal variants, to be clear. They're de novo or paternal and obviously more often paternal, um, but the method works very well there because those fractions aren't there. Once we move to lower allelic fraction, these start to combine and they become, they become much more challenging. So if we think about recessive variation and inherited variation, it's actually gotten better uh, over time. We, we've, we've developed quite a few methods to improve it, but the de novo variants are there. Um, long story short, in 14 samples uh, where they were referred um, uh, for um, standard of care testing, there were four pathogenic variants that were reported back to them from standard of care. We detected all four of them in non-invasive fetal sequencing, including a copy number variant. So even from a low allelic fraction sample where there was a copy number variant found on array, we can detect this event uh, within the non-invasive sequencing. And here's sort of the, the smattering of events that we were able to detect, splice site variants and uh, deletion and carrier variants in the mother. Um, about 60% of all pregnancies had at least one returnable result from a maternal carrier screen, um, which has in fact been shown in Nomad and other resources to be around expectation. Uh, but in, in the standard of care, we were able to detect all four um, diagnostic variants observed. Okay, so I am right at 4.55, so I said I would wrap up with five minutes to go. Um, and so here's where we are, uh, I think, and, and maybe this is the, the thing to think about is, as I said, there's these variant classes in this approach, I think, in precision medicine, where the genome is stable-ish, with, with a little getting a little more interesting over time, certainly, um, with, with somatic variants.
but there's really impact here for prenatal diagnostics, newborn screening, pediatric screening, and maybe even adult genetic testing. That information is accessible and reinterpretable over time. And is it complicated to be capturing a fetal exome uh, early in development? Absolutely. Um, is there already a CMG criteria on how to report those variants? Absolutely. Um, and I don't see any reason why it is scarier to have the information early um, and return exactly what we can return anyways from an invasive test, just using non-invasive methods, and then have that information to reinterpret over time. And so I think this is where we are. It's early days, it's technology development, it's methods, but I think this is where we're going um, in prenatal diagnostics. And I'll just leave it there. Uh, this is my lab. Um, they're all amazing. Uh, these are um, some of our partners uh, here at Columbia, certainly Ron. Katie was a, um, a co-lead uh, on, on that study. These are all the people that, that really kill themselves for Nomad. Um, so you should appreciate them because they are working hard and it's miserable, uh, but the, the outcome is great. Um, and then these are our colleagues in the Autism Consortium. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. You didn't embarrass me or anything. Thank you very much. Question. We'll start in the room. Any? So for coffee member variants, you said that, you know, basically there wouldn't be sufficient to be deleterious. So then what is your functional, what is the functional test then that triplicates or especially gain in coffee that's going to be to, to DNA or having a functional effect? Do you think it needs to be transcriptomic where you're seeing an increase in in transcriptomic signal for these genes, you can be gliomic. So what are the types of yeah. functional down? Try to get to the answer. Get Absolutely. To the are these really pleasant? No, it's a great question. So here's the problem. In the haploinsufficiency space, we have so many examples where we can match these things up. In the triple sensitivity space, we have almost none, right? Um, so that is the exact right question is what is happening on those duplications of the triple sensitive genes? And how is whatever is happening matching this massive enrichment of de novo missense variants that we see in those genes that are not living in genes that we associated with autism, which was a huge number? Um, and, and where is that? And I think that, I mean, the bets are on the proteome, right? I, I really think at some point we have to start to look at the proteome and try to understand exactly where these variants live um, and what they're doing to the protein. Do we have a gain of function mechanism? Do we have a dominant negative? You know, what is actually happening within this mechanism? And I think that we need multi- um, I think we need multi omics readout, but I don't know that transcriptomics is our best option here because basically we've done a lot of transcriptomics in reciprocal copy number variants. And we always, 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 if a gene's deleted, we can pretty much always, and, and expressed, we find it. If it's duplicated and expressed, we find it. So if it's expressed in the tissue you're looking at, I think you're just going to see upregulation. As a follow up question, are these genes, do they tend to aggregate or form dimers or triangles or quaternary structures where a gain of function uh, effect yeah. would be predicted, kind of like a good case story? No, it's it's a good question. We we haven't looked, we haven't actually taken the gene set and tried to put it through those um, analyses, and we really need to. It's a great question. Other questions? We have a question on Mark. There's a question. Can we read it? Uh, sure. Uh, so Jess Giordano said that the uh, great talk, the lowest fetal fraction you showed was 9.6%. Uh, what barriers do you see to perform well at 4% fetal fraction and are they easily addressed? Okay, so first of all, let's highlight the great talk part. She said that <laughs> we did what? So the exclamation point. And then she added, you know, she basically asked the most cutting part, uh, which is no surprise for Jess. Which is, uh, that's exactly right. So in um, NIPT screening, uh, one would like to see uh, the test done at 10 weeks and 4% fetal fraction. Um, she notes that the, the lowest we had in that study was 9.6%. Um, and to answer her question, I would love to reconsider the methods that we enrich fetal fraction a little bit, but I don't think we need to. I don't know that there are major barriers here. Um, other than trying to get more complex libraries out, which means maybe just more sample uh, so that we can sequence a little deeper so that every one of our reads, you know, we can go a little deeper on that fetal genome. But for those de novo variants, we have seen almost no movement. Uh, I think that the, the big barrier is gonna be in the inherited variants, where again, you saw those peaks start to merge together. And now we're talking about 1.02 alleles, 1.05 alleles, that's gonna get very hard.
Um, so I think what we really need now is just a lot of data. Uh, and we have it. We we have partners with Ron and 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 um, certainly a lot being driven uh, by Ron and Jess and others, uh, as well as a number of collaborators um, elsewhere in Katie and Brigham and Women's and, and and moving to other sites. So we just need a lot of data because what we really need to know is all the edge cases. I mean, this game is played on the edge cases and you don't learn about edge cases until you have lots and lots and lots of data. Good question. Just just a point. Mm -hmm. You can easily get the de mm -hmm. And if we just looked at carrier testing in the parents, then you would know where Absolutely. to look for the recessives and you could obsess over that. Yep. So a combination of knowing which couples are carrier couples yep. should solve that problem. It should solve that problem. And and um, as we've discussed before, we are working on methods. So you saw the autism work where I say, okay, I know that this variant is more likely to be impactful or a variant in this gene is more likely to be impactful. Well, now I can add a little prior to that, the Bayesian model. Uh, there's no reason I can't do the same thing in the analyses and that's what we've been doing. So we've been saying, okay, I know the mother's exome because I have it. And I may not know the fathers because I think ideally this would not involve a trio, although early on it certainly will have to because we all know the issue with finding fathers. Um, so from the mother, can I put a little bit of a prior on that variant and does that begin to weight it? And maybe can I overcome some of the fetal fraction challenge from that? Um, so early days testing, but it, it, it looks like we're doing pretty well, particularly in a targeted fashion. And that's the point, right? If we can do it targeted, it's much better. This is all completely unbiased across all 22,000 genes. So nothing I just showed you is selecting a gene panel or anything like that. So all the problematic genes are in there as well. So, I mean, by definition, that will only go up as we select. One other quick question. Though. Yeah. When I pull my hair out, you can see it's been like six months. Yeah. Uh, but um, is looking at either new genes or VUSs. And, you know, the ACMG criteria is a point system that uses a scale, but you give a number of other criteria and you go to a Bayesian analysis, which the point system doesn't. And I also know you work with Heidi. Mm -hmm. uh, so is there some way you can put together the, all the pieces and come up with a better way to to decide whether something is pathogenic from a clinical standpoint? Yep. We get these questions all the time. And I think yes and no. I think the conservative part of me says you probably don't want to be reporting variants for somebody who put a base factor on something and says there's an FDR of, of 5% here or 0.1%. Um, that certainly doesn't meet the, the standard that we would like to see. Um, and yet it's basically telling you what the next set of genes will be that you will be interpreting next, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that the middle ground has been those CNVs with very big effect, uh, where in fact they have a working group now working on trying to understand CNV interpretation because it is crazy for some of these genes that look to be triplosensitive with the effect sizes that we see in deletions that we already return um, that we're, we're not beginning to interpret those. I mean, I think those are kind of the low-hanging near-term goal. Long-term, kind of above my pay grade to think about how everybody wants to pursue um, new discovery and, and variants from new discovery. Great. Well, thank you Welcome. so much. I think the last question. Great. Uh, thank you. Well, no, no, no. Oh, yeah. We've got them tied down. Okay. <laughs> Please. So Going back to the genomics, and you show that the, both the enrichment rate and also the contribution rate is higher in those that below the opposite right? mm -hmm. But yet, the select the fatalities in the similar genome, the father, right? the father, 50-70%. So, what's the, and you also mentioned what's the deal there, right? Why? That's the why, why. And also, you, you mentioned. There is, you, you have the data to show that that rate is probably lower or maybe similar to in, in those two types. In those, uh, it's not worth it. They, they may have seen higher than lower than global government below. But so, so, yeah, so you, I mean, I, right, we have these data and, and, and you've seen them. So, um, the rate of Dodobo variation absolutely indeed be higher. Um, and as you know, because you showed up very nicely, 
There is a um, signal with inherited variation that we move up and get better at this. It, it gets a little better, and, and there that's contributing to some of the heritability, but of course the, the double variants are not. Um, first of all, the fecundity ratios for some of the neuropsychiatric disorders, some of those data are pretty old. And I would like to see them updated because even from what I showed, schizophrenia is sitting where autism is sitting and global global developmental delay is sitting there, if not, you know, maybe even a little above it. And so I think I find it to be very difficult um, to reconcile that based on the mutation rate data we have. Now there's a million other things. The selective, the reduced fecundity though, and the structural birth defects it's not that much different than an autism. And in fact, I think that the genetic architectures of autism and a, a significant fraction of the structural birth defects or the fetal anomalies, particularly the single anomalies, look very, very similar. It's not until you get into kind of multiple anomalies that they start to get up towards DD, but not not close still, right? I mean, I think the, the most optimistic estimates in, in severe Mendelians is 42, 45% of kind of diagnostic variants uh, that exist and in the multiple congenital anomalies, I don't know, anybody want to want to guess 30% maybe? I mean, the best data out there is what, 22, 24%? And I'm sure it'll go up a little bit from there. Um, so it seems to me that severe Mendelians and global developmental delay are still, in terms of de novo damaging variants, the strongest. Where those fertility ratio and fecundity numbers live um, I think they need to be updated. And, and, and of course, there's many other things that are contributing to that that have nothing to do with, with genetic variation um, and are societal and selective and sort of mating. And we actually talked about some of this over dinner. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it's probably time to try to align some of these things a little more. It's a good question. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.